Hello, good morning. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, today we have Beth Block, President of Block Insurance here, and uh, she's going to talk about the risk of sexual abuse and misconduct allegations uh, in your school and some steps you can take now to protect yourself and your business. Uh, we do expect a topic like this to generate quite a few questions, so please feel free to ask any questions that come up along the way. Is you will see a questions box in your GoToWebinar panel. Uh, just feel free to type those questions in, and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. And now I'd like to welcome Ms. Beth Block. Good morning, Beth. Good morning. Thank you so very much. I hope everybody is having a fantastic Tuesday. I know I am grateful that we have warmed up here in Florida. Sadly, I think some of you are still experiencing those chilling temperatures, and you do have my sympathy for that. Although this is a pretty heavy topic we're going to talk about, I want to assure you that it's important to talk and raise our awareness and maybe look at the way we're conducting our daily business inside our studio because there's so much that we can do to protect ourselves. I further want to tell you that an awful lot of times in my experience, an allegation is nothing more than that. It's an allegation. Perhaps nothing really happened, but either the parent of a child or the child themselves' perception is different than your instructor's perception, or worse yet, you have a family that owes you some money and they're looking to beat you out of the money by making an allegation. I have seen in the last 23 years probably 200 allegations that have come out of a situation such as that. So this is all about how to protect yourself against those allegations inside your studio. And there we go. When I began to put together this presentation, I googled martial arts abuse allegation and I pulled actual headlines out of the news. Sadly, these allegations all came off of the first two pages of Google results. So the first one happened in Maine in March of last year, and a martial arts teacher was accused of abusing children. The next one in the pink box is also from last year, just a few months ago, inside New York. And you'll see that a martial arts instructor pled no contest to sexual abuse allegations. In June of 2012 in Florida, a karate instructor was facing sexual abuse allegations. In October of last year in Illinois, a martial arts instructor pled guilty to six counts of exploitation of a minor. In Georgia, in December of 13, an instructor was accused and thankfully found not guilty. In Michigan in 09, an instructor was charged with sexual abuse. And in Texas of 2010, an instructor was charged with child sexual assault. These are actual news headlines, scouts honor, I didn't make them up. So one of the things that I find most disturbing about that trend as I'm doing the research is of the seven headlines, six were about guilty instructors. That's a pretty hefty number. And just so you know, I read all those articles about the accusations. I didn't just assume that they were all guilty. But that percentage is very, very large. For the one instructor that was found innocent, their life was still turned upside down for years. If you are actually charged by the police, and remember, they don't have to have made their case yet, they only need to have done a cursory investigation and decide that they're going to arrest you. If they arrest you, you now have all of the legal implications involved trying to defend yourself. 
you're very likely going to be prevented from doing your occupation because the law will tell you you cannot be around minors during the investigation. You're going to have media on your doorstep. That happened to that instructor in Georgia that was found innocent. Life became a living nightmare for that instructor and every other instructor that is actually accused. The average length of time in litigation over something like this is three years. So that's three years of your life in limbo. So what should you expect if an allegation is made against you or one of the instructors in your studio? You should expect that the police are going to interrogate the accused individual. You should accept, expect that the police are going to interview all your team members. Team members meaning the people on your payroll in your studio. You should expect the police will interview many of the students in your studio. Oftentimes these situations turn into fishing expeditions and if there's an allegation from one, the assumption is that there are going to be many children involved and so they're going to start interviewing children. If you stop and think about how that's going to ripple through your studio, I'm sure that you can imagine your studio at best is crippled because of all of the buzz among family, the families in your studio. At worst, your studio is out of business because everybody beats feet out of your studio and somewhere else. To add insult to injury, you should expect the media to show up. We all have watched the news with microphones stuck in somebody's face. Unfortunately, you and the accused are the ones that are going to have those mic microphones stuck in your face if an accusation is made. You can also expect that the media is going to show up and camp out at the home of the individual that's accused. The accused person may end up being arrested, and then there's court appearances, depositions, grand, grand jury um, trial and eventual trial to determine guilt or innocence. I know I personally don't want to be involved in a situation like that. I can't imagine any of you would want to live that either. It's important to remember that the statute of limitations on an allegation like this one does not even begin to run until the child turns 18. So if you're wondering if I have a five-year-old in my studio today, when can I stop worrying about this allegation? You're going to be worrying about that allegation for years after that child turns 18. The Statute of limitations varies from state to state, but if you use seven years as an average, you're looking at when the child turns 25. That's 20 years for a five-year-old. That's a really, really long time that this allegation is going to be around. The way you protect yourself against those allegations is to make sure that you're establishing procedures, that you're trained, that all of your staff members are trained, and that you can pull those procedures and that training out as Exhibit A in a court of law. You know, I'm old enough to remember Perry Mason. I'd watch Perry Mason on TV when I was a kid, and he would always take his Exhibit A into the courtroom in big four-foot by four-foot posters. Well, technology has left that far, far behind us, and we have moved on to the day and age of tablets being passed out to jurors. But you want to make sure that if you ever do end up in front of a jury, that you have that training and that you have those procedures that are always followed as Exhibit A going on the juror's tablets. 
So specific steps that you can take to protect your studio, and these are definitely not the only steps. These are a few steps. This is a starting point. So the things you want to do, you want to make sure that you have two instructors with minor students at all times. The reason for that is we live in a world where a child's assertion will always be believed in a court over an adult statement. I don't necessarily think that's the right place for us to be, but it is the place where our society is. The only way that you can counteract that is if you have two adults to testify, to corroborate one another's stories. It's also important to remember, since many of you are running studios with your spouse, that you and your spouse in the studio at the same time, you cannot corroborate one another's testimony. It's not permitted legally. So think about that too deep instruction. I know there's the financial consideration that you have to weigh against the allegation of abuse. Only you can weigh how much risk you're willing to take, but do it from an educated place. I strongly recommend that you do background checks on all instructors. There are so many services out there that allow you to do background checks prior to hiring. This is Exhibit A again when you get into a court of law. I did a background check. There was no history of sexual abuse. Again, there's a small fee involved in doing the background check. Only you can decide if the money is worth the protection. I'm always going to tell you the $20 or $30 fee is worth the protection. That's my opinion. I also highly recommend that you send your instructors through abuse and molestation training. As I talk to instructors in the martial arts industry, many of them are unaware of how to protect themselves, what to be looking for in children that's an indication the child is being abused somewhere else. As you and your instructor's knowledge is increased, your ability to protect yourself in your studio is increased. We are uh, working right now with a company called Presidium working to customize an abuse and molestation training program for the martial arts industry that we'll be able to offer to you and your instructors. So those are the do's. Those are the things that I'd love to see you implement inside your studio to protect yourself. Let's talk about a few of the don'ts. Oftentimes, whether it's going to a tournament, whether it's picking up after schoolers, we find instructors putting a minor student in a vehicle alone with the instructor. Sadly, that puts us back to one adult, one student. We're back to the student, if they make an allegation, our legal system is going to believe the child's allegation before they're going to believe the adult statement. So you want to try to avoid that one-on-one -on -one situation in a vehicle. This next don't I know is a very contentious issue inside the martial arts world. I recommend that you include in your employee handbook a policy that your instructors may not date minor students. I want to share with you a circumstance that happened inside another studio, and I believe strongly that this could happen in almost any studio in America. There were a couple of kids that were two years apart in age, and they came up in the studio together, came up through the ranks together. The older student turned 18 and became a junior instructor at the studio. The younger student is 16, still a minor. When the older student became a paid instructor, the two began to date. 
when the paid instructor decided the relationship wasn't working out and ended the relationship, the 16-year-old student and her family accused the 18-year-old of statutory rape and went on to sue the studio for condoning and permitting the relationship to be conducted. That studio had to defend and protect itself, still embroiled in the situation. I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to forbid those dating relationships. If you choose to permit them, please do it knowing that you're taking the risk. The third thing that I'm going to suggest today that you implement and make sure that you avoid is ignoring warning signs in minor students' behavior. There are many warning signs that a child is being molested. And one of the things that you have to remember is that if the child is being molested at home by a parent, by a boyfriend, by a grandfather, the molester is often looking to deflect suspicion off themselves, so they accuse someone else. You or your instructor could be that someone else that's accused. You're still back in the situation of having to legally defend yourself. If you're aware that there's a change in a minor student behavior, and you report your suspicion anonymously to the abuse hotline in your state, you're protecting yourself. And that's worth doing. You're also protecting the student. And the bottom line is, I believe all of you are teaching minors martial arts so that you can help students protect themselves. So some of the warning signs, and these are just some of them, some of the warning signs to watch out for in a child. If you have a child that was previously outgoing and becomes very withdrawn, you need to be concerned. You need to start keeping notes on your concerns. And eventually, if there's not an explanation, you need to consider reporting that to the abuse hotline. If you have a child that is using sexual language that is not age appropriate, you need to be aware that that means that they have sexual knowledge of a sort that's not age appropriate. Again, probably needs to go ahead and report that to the abuse hotline. If you have a child that is touching other children inappropriately, beyond the innocence of the age appropriateness, another warning sign to watch out for. These are just a few warning signs. We can talk at greater length about specific warning signs um, in, another, in another format on another day, or you're welcome to email me for some more specific warning signs. My email address, I'm sure that Clayton will provide to all of you, but I'll share with you right now. It's Beth, that's B-E-T-H, at block, B-L-O-C-A, insurance.net. So you and your instructors want to watch out for those warning signs. You're protecting yourself and you're protecting the students. The next topic that I think it's important for us to raise our awareness about is child-on-child -child abuse issues. Now, in all of the years that I have worked with programs providing services to children, I have found that what most often happens is one child sexually abuses another. Very rarely have I actually seen an adult abuse a child. So it's that frequency issue that you have to be concerned with. And if you have after-school uh, martial arts programs in your studio, that's when you're going to have this issue. Some of the things you can do inside your studio to manage this risk is making sure that children are not left alone with one another. 
you're denying the opportunity for a child to molest another child when they're not left unsupervised. You want to watch out for the kids that are always wanting to go to the bathroom together. I had a studio several years ago give me a call, and these two little boys, always, always best friends, wanted to go to the bathroom together. And sadly, on one particular day, the boys were taking so long that the instructor called into the bathroom. When he didn't get a response, stuck his head inside the bathroom and found one little boy with the other little boy's penis in his mouth. It also came out during the course of the investigation that the victim boy had been sodomized with a stick that was inside the bathroom during the situation. Needless to say, that studio is long since gone. And you want to make sure inside your studio that the kids aren't getting the opportunity. You're sending the kids for the after school martial arts into the bathroom to get changed, but you need to keep a very careful eye on who's in there, how long are they in there, move them out, deny them the opportunity to molest one another. The next thing you want to do is make sure that there are no hiding places inside your studio. I've been inside many, many studios over the years, and in after-school programs and summer camp programs, the kids are wanting to build uh, forts. They'll build a fort out of chairs and towels. They'll build a fort out of puzzle mats. Bottom line, if you allow them to build these forts, or if your studio is designed in such a way that you don't have clear sight lines into all parts of your studio, the opportunity exists for children to sneak away unobserved and molest one another. We've already talked about some of the behavioral signs that warn of a child being molested. You want to keep your eyes open for those warning signs. You also want to be aware that the child that is being molested somewhere else, at home, at a family member's house, in school, that is the child that is most likely to molest their peers. So keep your, keep your mind top of awareness in such a situation. And then last but not least, you want to make sure that your junior instructors aren't left alone with children. Although a junior instructor can be that second set of eyes if they're 16 years or older to back you up in a court of law, that junior instructor, when you background check them, is not apt to have anything on their background because their particular um, sexual preference, if it goes towards children, will not have yet asserted itself. So you protect yourself by making it a policy that those junior instructors are not ever, ever left alone supervising children. Now I'm talking about the child-on-child -child abuse issues and the supervision most specifically as it would relate to those of you that have after-school programs. But these can also be issues in your evening classes if your students' parents aren't staying and observing the class. So just think about your particular studio, how things run inside your studio, and be aware that your risk comes in when there's not other people observing everything that's going on. So some of the issues that you need to watch out for with team members and volunteers. We talked briefly about the volunteers or team members dating younger team members. And that's something we truly have to be aware of. We have to be aware of any of our over 18 instructors dating any of our under 18 students. 
we have to be concerned about our instructors and volunteers that are teaching students outside the studio. Inside America's courtrooms, this can be viewed as an extension of your services, even though the team member isn't doing it on your behalf. And if an accusation of abuse is made, the studio can and will be drug into the case because we live in a country where they're looking for the deepest pockets possible. And your studio's pockets are going to be deeper than your instructor's or volunteer's pockets, even if it's just insurance pockets. And since I mentioned insurance, I'll briefly point out each and every one of you want to check your insurance liability to see if you have abuse and molestation coverage on your policy. Many of the insurers charge separately and extra. Many studios don't purchase that coverage. I urge you to see what you have. To kind of tie together why it's so important to be careful of those relationships that extend beyond instructor-student, it's important to remember that there is a hero worship that happens between the student and the instructor. And because of that hero worship, the relationship is not going to be a relationship of equals, even if the student and the instructor are the same age. If you add into that mix a relationship between people that are not equals, but people that are not both of majority age, now you have a real problem, and the courts are going to hold you accountable for that real problem. So I mentioned briefly the abuse and molestation insurance, and I'm urging each of you to see if you have that coverage. The reasons I think you want that coverage that you might not thought of when you were looking at the cost is it provides a lawyer to defend the studio. So let's say that the accusation does come and you have to defend yourself. Well, right now, without that insurance, you're looking at an average attorney rate per hour of $250 an hour the insurance is going to give that lawyer to you, so you're not coming out of pocket to get that legal defense. The second thing to remember is that you're going, the studio is going to be defended, but so is the accused instructor as long as the instructor didn't do it. If the instructor did abuse or molest a minor, they're going to be left on their own, but I can't imagine you would truly be concerned about defending somebody that did something like this. And the last thing to remember when you look at this insurance is that if, in fact, such a situation did happen inside your studio, there is some kind of money in the policy for the victim award. It depends on how much coverage you purchased and how severe the abuse or molestation was, whether or not it will be sufficient. But at least there's something for a victim award. A couple of thoughts before we move on from this point. First, sexual abuse is just starting to trend up inside the studios. The issues include junior instructors getting involved with students after-school students, actions and words with one another. And most martial arts policies exclude coverage for the exposure. One of the other things to think about as this is just starting to trend up is, are you with an insurance company that has experience and can give you a plan on how to deal with that media attention you're going to receive? The last time you want to be putting that kind of plan together is when somebody is sticking the microphone in your face. You want to think about it. You want to have the plan. You want to practice for it in your mind, hoping that it never happens. Quite like the self-defense that we do when we train, 
we're practicing so we'll know what happens if the worst comes our way, but we hope it never does come our way. We talked about disgruntled parents, the family that owes you money and is trying to beat their way out of what they owe you by making an accusation. They're the ones that can bring the 6 o'clock news to your front door. So we talked about that crisis management assistance. We talked about the insurance agent and company providing that crisis management assistance. We talked about making sure they have expertise in that area. You want to make sure that the plan they're giving you is a plan that will see you through well when the worst comes to your door. We talked about the parents that are late to paying. We talked about the kids that are being abused and molested elsewhere being most likely to abuse and molest the other children in your program. I very much am hoping to get feedback from many of you on this whole concept of dating among your junior instructors. I know this is a sticky point, so I am going to um, I hope that we can talk that through some in the questions that you're going to bring my way. I like to share a quote from Warren Buffett, who I happen to admire greatly. He says that risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. Certainly inside your studio, I think you would agree that if you had a beginning student trying to execute a 560 uh, jump kick of some sort, there is a lot of risk there because they have no idea what they're doing. I like to provide a corollary to Mr. Buffett's quote, and my corollary is we can choose to shun ignorance and mindfully choose what risks to keep and what risks to transfer to an insurance company. If you choose to keep the risk of allowing junior instructors to date students, as long as you're mindfully making that choice, I can't tell you you're wrong. Only you can choose which risks you're going to keep. So Clayton, I'm going to turn it back over to you, and then maybe we can open up to some questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Beth. Uh, I wanted to let everyone know that Beth will be one of uh, over 50 speakers we're having at the Martial Arts Super Show uh, this summer, starting on June 30th. Uh, so if you, if you want to kind of dive in more, get to meet Beth, and kind of hear what she has to say on this and other topics, I encourage you to attend. Uh, and today, for, for just attending the webinar, we're offering everyone 10% off on registration for the May Super Show uh, with promo code WEBINAR. Now, this promo code is only good for today, so if you're watching a uh, recorded version of this uh, sometime after today, you will no longer be able to use that promo code. Uh, but that will save 10%. Uh, early bird pricing right now is... 249 so with that discount, uh, your tickets will be about $225, which is quite the bargain. Uh, so again, the 2014 Martial Arts Super Show, we're going to be back at the Venetian, the Palazzo, Las Vegas, uh, masupershow.com, or you can call 866-626-6226. Uh, we do have quite a few questions that have come in so far. Uh, if you have any other questions that you haven't asked yet, just feel free to type them into that question box right now on the GoToWebinar panel. And we're going to go ahead and open things up. Uh, first question we have is, I have a junior instructor that grew up in the studio with another teen. They are now dating. Is there any concern for my school? Well, we talked about that during the uh, webinar, and I very much appreciate the question. It is so common, and we want to reinforce the concern is there. If things do not go well between the junior instructor and the teen, you have liability. And that liability extends all the way out until the student turns at least 25. The statute of limitations varies from state to state. 
So we want to make sure that you're aware of your liability. If you choose that you want to control that liability by not permitting that situation, you need to have an employee policy that you distribute to all of your team members, letting them know that that dating is not permitted. And then the team member would have to choose, do they want to continue being a junior instructor or do they want to um, continue dating the other student? Great. Uh, next question. We have an open seating area for parents to watch classes. Will that help, meaning their witnesses, if there are any accusations? As long as you have people sitting there, absolutely. And again, I, I think that probably speaks back to your making sure you have open line of sights and no hiding spots in your school. Exactly correct. Um, what are your thoughts on using unvetted parents as volunteers at overnight camps? Would you recommend doing this, or is the risk too great? And uh, would you recommend only using paid staff? That is a fantastic question. I love it. What I always share when we talk about um, volunteers that have not been background checked, as long as they are never left alone with students, never left in positions without open lines of sight, you're OK. You just want to make sure at those overnight events you have an ample number of paid instructors that have been vetted to always keep those unvetted volunteers in sight. The, uh, the next question, this, this may be one that you can answer. I know you're uh, out of Florida. Uh, somebody's asking if you know the specific statute of limitations for Florida. Absolutely. Florida is seven years after the minor turns 18. So we're looking at to age 25. Having said that, there is a little caveat in the law that says if it's a hidden memory, it's seven years after the memory is recovered. So if suddenly the individual remembers at the age of 35, they have until they're 42 to sue you. And that's interesting. What is the uh, burden of proof for uh, recovered memories? Um, there would be psychological testing that would be involved in that. The reality is, though, that we all live in a country where a woman can put a hot cup of coffee between her legs, and it's McDonald's fault when she got burned. And we have to remember that's the legal environment we're living in. So the burden of proof is always going to rest much more heavily on you. This is another uh, question that kind of relates to burden of proof. If you've done all the right things and have an accusation, uh, how do you prove yourself not guilty uh, when there's no evidence, just a he said, she said situation? Well, you want to think back to those exhibit A's we talked about. Here is the um, background check I did. And here is our policies and procedures that are applied consistently. And here is a record of somebody who didn't adhere to our policies and procedures that we terminated. And then last but not least, try very hard to not ever leave anybody in a position of he said, she said. I take the adult class in the studio that I go to. And because I am so aware of what can happen, if at the end of the evening a teen student is waiting for a parent to pick them up, I will not leave the studio until the teen has been picked up because I don't want my instructor in the position of being left alone with a teen. That, um, leaving, so it, it seems like the focus is making sure that there are always another set of eyes. Uh, this question is related. It's not possible to have a second instructor, as I am the only instructor. However, I try to have a parent watching class. Uh, so I, I think the, the question here is, parents watching class, are, is, is that enough to protect you? As long as you have that second set of adult eyes, 
they tell the truth on the stand, that is enough to protect you. Something else that individual might want to consider, and this is a double-edged sword, is video cameras inside the studio taping and keeping the tape. The reason it's a double-edged sword is first and foremost, cameras don't pick up every nook and cranny inside your studio. So the allegation could be that it happened where the camera couldn't see. The second thing to remember, and if you're the only instructor, it's a non-issue because I know you won't um, abuse or molest a student, but if in the future you end up with an instructor that does, you now have the evidence that, that proves the guilt. How often should I perform a background check on my staff? Is the initial background check at hiring enough to protect me? Um, the recommendation in the industry is every five years. So the initial and then once every five years if the staff member is still with you. Excellent. Um, I have a student at my summer camp um, and my after school program that is it's saying things of a sexual nature. What's my liability? Oh my goodness gracious. Um, well, if that child begins to molest other children, the liability is clear cut. Um, it happened on your premises, on your watch, you're on your own. If that child is saying things that disturb other parents, the liability is clear cut if you allow the child to stay in your program. It is a terrible, awful situation to be in, but clearly you have the awareness that something there doesn't quite meet, meet the, the smell test. And your choices, in my opinion, really boil down to making that anonymous phone call to the abuse hotline. If you do that, you want to be sure you get the badge number of who you reported to and document, document the day and time. They don't get your name, so the only way you can prove if an accusation comes back at you that you did it is having the date, time, and badge number when you made the report. So that's choice one. Choice two is ask the family to leave your studio. You need to be careful about how you approach that, and that's a conversation I'm happy to have with anybody one-off unless everybody says, Beth, tell us more on that topic. Excellent. Um, is there any particular program you'd recommend for abuse and molestation training? Absolutely. I strongly recommend the Presidium program. They have worked with many organizations across the country that are youth-oriented. I'm working with them right now developing a program that is martial arts focused. I'm hoping to be able to bring the exciting news to you soon that I'm going to have that training available to you and your instructors and have it be martial arts specific. And one more question. How much liability, if any, do owners have when the situation involves an adult student, not an employee or volunteer, abusing a minor student if there's no knowledge of anything going on? As long as there's no knowledge and it doesn't happen on your premises, no responsibility. If it happens on your premises, you're going to have some ancillary responsibility just because it happened in the studio. And then the last point I want to make on that topic is, remember, it would need to be a student, not a volunteer. As soon as you have an adult volunteer, you're pretty much in the same boat with the same responsibility to supervise the volunteer as you are with a paid team member. And the last question, um, and this, is, this will be a good one. Most of our uh, attendees can probably start working on this immediately. Uh, how do I get instructors to be more aware of how to handle this issue? I think they need to go through training. And to that end, I'm working with Presidium to put together training. I am 
happy to do a teleconference for any of your schools with your instructors on the phone. Um, would even put up, um, if anybody thinks it's useful, this uh, PowerPoint that we went through today to raise instructors' awareness. I have to tell everyone that my experience with instructors in this area over the last 24 months is it's going to take time to get them to see the bigger picture. I think one of the things that makes a difference is for them to hear real cases that have happened and hear about real instructors that have gone to jail. And we will certainly be posting this uh, recorded version of this webinar on our YouTube page. So if you're not already connected, you can go to our website, uh, youtube.com slash M-A-I-A success, so Maya success, or just do a YouTube search for Martial Arts Industry Association. And uh, this, this will be the top video in our webinars playlist if you wanted to share that back. And uh, Beth, if, if somebody has interest in the Presidium program, uh, what would you recommend right now for, for school owners? Email me and I'll get you the link to Presidium and you can get moving on it right away. Perfect. Well, Beth, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Uh, thank you for kind of covering this uh, somewhat harder but very important topic. Uh, I, I know I've learned a lot. I hope our attendees have. Uh, if you want to see Beth again at the Super Show, please take the time today to register for the show and save that 10% with the promo, co promo code WEBINAR, W-E-B-I-N-A-R, at checkout. Or you can give us a call at 866-626-6226 and register over the phone. Uh, this next slide here is going to have Beth's contact information. So if you want to send her an email or give her a phone call uh, to talk about the Presidium program, or I'm sure you're open for any other conversation. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, uh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And thank you to everyone for attending today.